In this session, we'll focus on the call of Abraham. Abraham comes from Lower Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is really the name for the land between the two rivers. And it has a lot of different looks. Here's one look of some of the landscape one can see in the Mesopotamian region. And here's the Euphrates River, which many of the important cities like Ur are near the Euphrates River in Lower Mesopotamia. And Ab Abraham earlier moved up to Haran with his father in the end of Genesis chapter 11. And then it's from Haran from the upper Mesopotamian region that the Lord calls him. And we read this in Genesis chapter 12. Yahweh said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Uh, this is a very significant call, and it's the first of several times where the Lord communicates with Abraham in Genesis. And together we call these the Abrahamic covenant. And here we see from the beginning a focus on land, on family, or the word a few verses later will be offspring or seed and blessing. These three elements provide really sort of the big things that the whole rest of the Torah focuses upon. Now let's spend a moment and think through ancient covenants. These are contracts or legal commitments in the ancient world. And the ideology of this, or I guess the metaphorical substructure, you would say, is making of non-kin into kin. And let's look at a couple of pictures which help us understand all of this. Uh, here's an ancient Mesopotamian covenant between a king and his vassal slave. This is between Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and Merodach Baladan, the mm, small-time king of Babylonian in those days. These are not the high days of the Babylonian kingdom. And so the shorter figure to the right is Merodach Baladan. He may have been a short person of stature. It's hard to say. He wasn't terribly important or effective as a leader. But the artisans might have been showing Sennacherib's greater importance as he stands before this man who commits himself before him. And there's other symbols of the uh, Mesopotamian mythology and power uh, on the top of this uh, stella. And this kind of relationship is then like a father and son or a slave and a master that they establish. Now here is an ancient Mesopotamian covenant between a god and a king. And here we find the god Shamash, the sun god. And standing before him is great king Hammurabi from much longer ago in the 18th uh, century BCE during the high point of the uh, Babylonian earlier Babylonian Empire. And Shamash, uh, he sits on his throne with his feet upon a footstool, and Hammurabi has his hand up to his mouth. He's offering uh, a blessing to the god. And there's a cloth wrapped over his arm. Many of the images we see of covenants in the ancient world of all sorts, there's this cloth over the arm, which is part of the uh, social structure of this. And in this case, the god, Shamash, he, along with Marduk, is giving the law to Hammurabi and charging Hammurabi to rule with righteousness using the law over his entire empire. Well, let's briefly sketch out some of uh, the covenantal background we see in the scripture. Perhaps the essence of covenant is captured in this oft-repeated phrase, I will be your God and you will be my people. And there's a few versions like that. This phrase gets it exactly the heart of covenant. A relationship made between God and his own people. We see this uh, in Genesis, beginning in Genesis 17 with the sign of the covenant of circumcision and on and on. Now there's two different life settings uh, that sort of 
stand behind this covenantal relationship. One is marriage and one is sonship, in, in uh, adoption of sonship. And in both of these life settings, we see somebody who's not kin in the marriage relationship become kin. And the marriage relationship, say, uh, its covenantal structure in Genesis is illustrated when uh, Shechem, a Canaanite, violates Dinah, and her brothers, Simeon and Levi, will take vengeance on Shechem by suggesting that Shechem and his whole household take the sign of the covenant circumcision, which of course they do, in order to marry Dinah. But while they're recovering, they're slaughtered by uh, Simeon and Levi. Um, we can also think of the adoption of, uh, I guess, a son, and this becoming a son of a, a person. And so in this case, the metaphorical one that I have in mind is when Ahaz, the father of King Hezekiah, he was in a lot of trouble. And so he submitted himself as the son of Tiglath-Pileser, thus giving over the sovereignty of Jerusalem thereafter by becoming servant and vassal to the Assyrians. Now, in recent years, um, there's been a lot of negotiation and debate over covenant nomenclature, and there's been plenty of publications. This is a long-running discussion, and part of it turns on the language that's been traditionally used. With the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants in particular, there's been a lot of talk of conditional versus unconditional covenant. This is a really important discussion, but the nomenclature kind of uh, creates a little bit of an obstruction. And in just the past few years, there's been some uh, help from Gordon Johnston's unpublished studies and a few people have been publishing those, where Gordon Johnston has gotten around to the idea that the Davidic covenant in particular, it is an irrevocable covenant, but it is one that has conditions placed upon it. That is to say, it's a permanent covenant. God's good for it. But whether the kingdom stands or falls, that depends upon their obedience to the covenantal obligations. And so when the prophets come and they preach against the covenant breaking of the kingdom until the kingdom eventually goes into exile, those show a clear conditionality. But the covenant itself is not broken for the prophets speak of the hope of the restoration of the Davidic king. So if I can say it this way, I think this talk of unconditional conditional unconditional, the idea of no matter what, that's perhaps what's behind it. And that's where Johnston has helped us with this terrific idea of irrevocable covenant, which has conditional terms put upon it. As we think through the story of God's covenant, which begins with Abraham and his people, we're going to want to attend to this relationship that he established with Abraham and the significance that this points to in bringing blessing to all peoples. As the Lord said, Yahweh said, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. In this session, we're going to focus on the story of Abraham waiting for offspring. The Lord called him and made a big promise to him. He promised land, seed, blessing. Abraham's already a fairly old person. And though the Lord's promise was huge, it had universal implications. Abraham fixated on what was most important to him and his wife. That is, they were childless, and he was excited to have a child. So over the course of the next 10 chapters and 25 years, we wait with Abraham for the fulfillment of this part of the covenant that God made with him. 
The narration in the book of Genesis gives us Abraham's age at regular intervals. In chapter 12, we know that he's 75 years old. He still doesn't have children. In chapter 16, we learn that he's 85 years old. So 10 years has gone by. The very next chapter, chapter 17, he's 99. So 14 years goes by between these two chapters. We don't get another update until near, I guess, the time that Isaac's born, when Abraham is, in fact, 100 years old. That is to say, over these chapters, time slows down, or the narrative gets at more and more details the closer we get to the fulfillment of this part of the uh, covenant that God made with him. Now, as it turns out, all of this is a setup, but let's take a look at how this unfolds. Along the way, then, there is some, I guess, wrong turns on the way toward waiting for fulfillment. In chapter 15, the Lord comes to Abraham, and we learn about an inheritance that Abraham thinks is going to go to his slave. Abraham says, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Abraham's a little bit bitter here. He trusted the Lord, and he's making sense of the Lord's promise in light of his reality, and he's a little bit disappointed. At first, that's not what he thought, but this is what he thinks now. The Lord responded to him. Then the word of Yahweh came to him. This man will not be your heir, but your son, your own flesh and blood will be your heir. So he took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed Yahweh and he credited it to him as righteousness. So the Lord responds to Abraham's idea and says, no, that's not your heir. It's going to come from your own body. Now in chapter 16, we see another wrong turn along the way. We see um, possible inheritance may go through Sarah's slave. Now, we kind of read between the lines here, perhaps, between chapters 15 and 16, and we wonder, maybe Sarah has a conversation with him. Well, what did he say about me? He didn't say anything about you. Well, maybe you should sleep with my slave. And so Sarah reasons that her slave is her property, and so if her slave has offspring through her husband, it'll be her offspring. So. In a strange way, through trusting the Lord and making sense of their circumstances, he winds up sleeping with his wife's slave to get her pregnant to bear a child. And of course, he does get Hagar pregnant. She bears Ishmael, and everyone thinks that this is Abraham's heir. That's the way it goes for the next 14 years till the story picks up in Genesis chapter 17. And in Genesis chapter 17, Abraham laughs. Well, that's in the middle of the story. The story is the Lord comes to Abraham and says, you need to get ready. You're about to have a child. Everyone needs to be circumcised as a sign of your covenant with me. And Abraham's whole point is, a child, I have a child. I have Ishmael. And the Lord kind of winds up being talked into by Abraham. Okay, I'll take care of Ishmael too, but you need to get ready. You and Sarah are going to have a child. And so here we find a very uh, interesting way that things work. Abraham had been good with the idea that the Lord had fulfilled his word through Ishmael for the past 14 years. But Abraham was on an entire fantasy trip. For the Lord had in mind that he and Sarah would bear a child and that this child would be the son of promise. Chapter 18, Sarah has her opportunity to laugh. When the three guests come and speak to Abraham about, get ready, a child's going to come. And Sarah laughs in the tent and she denies it. Now, all of this is, I suppose, a play setting up the birth of Isaac. Now in chapter 20, they still haven't had a child,
but Abraham's in trouble again. During an economic depression, they move out to uh, the realm of King Abimelech, and Abraham's wife, she's old, she's 90, but she's beautiful. And so Abraham winds up saying, she's my sister. And he winds up, Abimelech, taking Sarah into his harem. Now, we need to know something about this story. We need to know that this is not Abimelech's child. This is Abraham's child. And so that's where we come into it. And the Lord comes to Abimelech in a vision of the night. And then we read, and then God said in a dream, yes, I know that you did this with a clear conscience. So I have kept you from sinning against me. That is why I did not let you touch her. As a small aside, it's very interesting here that Abimelech's just living his life, but the Lord shows that invisible to us as humans is the Lord's work sometimes. Abimelech is unaware of God's activity protecting Sarah. And then God goes on and says to him in the dream, now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you and you will live. And if you do not return her, you may be sure that you and all who belong to you will die. Interestingly, this is the first use of the word navi or prophet in scripture. It doesn't always work this way, but a lot of times the first use of a term in scripture turns out to be important. And the first two uses of prophet in the Pentateuch are important as well. A prophet is one who, as we learn here, advocates for those under the judgment of God. The second use of the term prophet is going to be in Exodus chapter 7. There we learn that a prophet is a spokesperson for God. In this case, uh, to come back on track, Abimelech learns that um, he needs to give this woman back and get this man, this prophet, to pray for him. He does give Sarah back. And Sarah and Abraham, they have a child, Isaac. He laughs. Their laughter of doubt becomes laughter of joy in the fulfillment of God's word. Yet, as we'll see, all of this is a setup for something else. In this session, we're going to look at one of the side stories that comes up while we're waiting for the fulfillment of God to give a child to Abraham and Sarah, namely the cities of the plain. And because of the events in our own day, this is one of the several passages in the Pentateuch and in the Christian scriptures which has come under increasing scrutiny. We'll look at this just a little bit, but with more broad concerns in mind. Now, to get at this, Brevard Child said this, uh, an Old Testament scholar, he said, how can one ever use the response of the Hebrew patriarchs as an ethical norm when their conduct is filled with flagrant immorality? What Childs is getting at here is this theological tension that we feel as interpreters. And the questions are many, but they turn on how can narratives give ethical instruction when they're just describing what happens? Who's to pick out the norms? And another deeper problem that Childs is getting at is the ancestors do a lot of things wrong. How can we use stories of sin and immorality for ethical instruction at all? Well, what I'd like to suggest is the messy Genesis stories of domestic dysfunction and that's practically a theme of the book, and the social misbehavior. These offer manifold theological instruction and ethical instruction, especially by means of negative example. Now, it's more complicated than this, but in simple terms, the, sin, the family sin stories of Genesis, they do not celebrate reckless living, but they signal the dangers of defying God's righteous standards. Uh, there are definitive judgments and they have their place, but real life and real people 
are complex. And the biblical narratives get at some of those complications and messiness that characterize lives. And these narratives have increased value for theological and ethical instruction. And I would suggest the negative stories, uh, especially the worst ones, are used often by the prophets to instruct God's people. Well, let's focus on this issue of sexual purity in creation context. There's just a few short points, not to belabor them, but human sexuality is procreative. It's good. The Lord said, multiply, fill the earth, he tells both Adam and Noah. Then there's also the sense of covenantal fidelity in the sexual relationship between a man and a woman. Leave your father and mother and cling to your spouse. And the first humans exemplify the ideal relationship, naked and unashamed. And it's only through human sinfulness that the shamefulness comes into all this. And it's, uh, it's really, I guess, a book like Song of Songs in the Hebrew Bible that focuses on that naked and unashamed element that still exists outside the garden. Now, our more particular focus for the moment, and we'll need to connect these, is when the wrath of God comes against the wickedness of the Canaanites. Now, we might think God comes to a snap judgment, but that's not so. Genesis 15 shows us the patience of God with the Canaanites. They are a wicked people, but God's not ready to strike them down. Their wickedness is not full, God says to Abraham. So there's deferred judgment. A lot of times we think of God's patience and deferred judgment when it comes to his people. But there's also deferred judgment even with his enemies. And the same theme is brought up and tied into the ethic of Israel in Leviticus 18, where we notice that Canaan's sustained rebellion against God's will is a reason that, as it says in Leviticus, the land will vomit out the Canaanites for their immorality. But that's no different than Israel. An identical judgment awaits Israel. Israel, if they reject God's will, will be judged when the land vomits them out for their Canaanite-like rebellion, says Leviticus 18. So this judgment that we see in Genesis 19 and 20 against the cities of the plain, they're just focusing on Sodom, Gomorrah, but it's a bigger disaster than that. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, these cities that God pours his wrath upon become a symbol which the prophets use again and again when they speak of God's doom that will fall upon Israel and Judah when they reject his will. We see this in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and many of the other prophets. The whole land of Israel will be a burning waste of salt and sulfur, nothing planted, nothing sprouting, no vegetation growing on it, it will be like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma Zeboim, which Yahweh overthrew in his fierce anger. That is judgment about Israel that is promised in the covenant in Deuteronomy 29. Isaiah chapter 1 brings it up this way. Unless Yahweh Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of Yahweh, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Jeremiah says, And among the prophets of Jerusalem I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. They are like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. So the prophets demonstrate that the wicked stories of the Pentateuch are especially relevant to instructing God's people to try to turn them away from the certain doom of rejecting his will. Now, we're not entirely certain where these cities of the plain were, but they're possibly under this lower part of the Dead Sea that we see in our maps. 
Now, whereas Abraham showed his hospitality by preparing, um, I guess, one of his animals as a feast for his guests, Lot's hospitality uh, takes a very um, ominous turn. Lot had two guests over, and they ran into some trouble with the people of the town. And Lot said to the people of the town who wanted to rape his guests, Look! I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do whatever you want with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under the protection of my roof. Now that's very hospitable, but it's also a terrible story. Now this winds up maybe being part of the rationale of an explaining the motives of Lot's daughters when we come to the second account of drunkenness in the Bible. In the first account of drunkenness, Noah lay inebriated and naked, and Ham sin, whatever it was, brought about the cursing of the Canaanites. Here in this second account of drunkenness, think with Lot's daughters. They've seen a terrible catastrophe fall upon their hometown, and they live in a cave with their father. Uh, here's how the text goes, Genesis 19, verse 31. One day the older, older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man around here to give us children, as is the custom all over the earth. Let's get our father to drink wine, and then sleep with him, and preserve our family line through our father. So here's a perverse trickery, taking sexual advantage of their father in incest, using his inebriation to do so. In this case, we come to a story of uh, one of the many accidents that we have in Genesis. Here's the accident of Lot's twofold uh, incestuous relationship. And the text highlights it this way. That night, they got their father to drink wine, and the older daughter went in and slept with him. He was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, they got their father to drink wine. That night also, the younger daughter went in and slept with him. And again, he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. Now, what we learn here then is uh, this terrible sin brings about as an outcome the birth of two more arch enemies of Israel. That is the Ammonites and the Moabites. So the outcome of the first three accounts of drunkenness in Scripture, once when Noah got drunk, twice when Lot got drunk, is uh, the sexual deviation. And again, we're not sure what Ham did. We're very confident of what uh, Lot's daughters did. And this brings about, in these three cases, the three most cursed people of ancient Israel, the Canaanites, the Ammonites, and the Moabites. So the Bible does not shy away from stories of sin, and even stories with great controversy. But it's wrong to take the view that they don't have anything ethical to teach us. Un stories of unethical behavior and misbehavior have much to offer doomed people that don't obey the will of God. In this session, we're going to look at the near sacrifice of Isaac which appears in Genesis 22. Now the difficulty with this story isn't understanding exactly what it says. The difficulty comes with, this is the New Testament's go-to when the New Testament wants to illustrate what faith is. Yet no one wants to trust God the way Abraham needed to trust God. But the New Testament repeatedly Romans 4, Hebrews 11, James 2, use this event in Abraham's life and use Abraham as a symbol of faith. Well, how does it fit? The narrative structure of Genesis 12 through 22, uh, when we look at the whole thing, God promises Abraham land, seed, blessing, and then Abraham waits for seed for 10 chapters and 25 years. And then finally, there's fulfillment in chapter 21. 
And there we would think that's a climax. And it is in a sense, but what we learn when we turn the page is the whole thing is a setup. When we turn the page, there is the test of Abraham in chapter 22. And we realize that we need that whole story of waiting, waiting, waiting for God to bring this about. And all that this means for Abraham and for Sarah, because as horrifying as it is to think about a child sacrifice, we're not just thinking about it in the abstract, we're thinking about what Abraham needs to do and what it means to him. So it turns out that the birth of Isaac is penultimate with a surprise, kick us down the stairs in the next chapter. And we come all the way back around verbally to Genesis chapter 12, verse one, in the beginning of Genesis 22, where we hear a echo of the call of Abraham in his test. Genesis 12, one says, go forth from your country, your people, your father's house. And in Genesis 22, we have the same threefold structure. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go forth to the land that I will show you. Now the journey to Mount Moriah, the scriptures don't record any talks that they had on the way there. There's a little bit of talk when they get there, but it's all left to our imagination. The backstory is for us to figure out what it was that Abraham thought about for those three days and what it was he may have said. And there's no shortage of interpretations here. But I think for me, one of the things I'd be thinking about, what am I going to tell Sarah? Honey, I'm home. Glad to see you. Where's Isaac? I need to talk with you. Great, we'll talk after dinner. Where's my son? That's what I need to talk to, with you about. What do you need to talk about? Well, you know how God sometimes talks to me and tells me what to do? Yeah. You're not going to believe what he told me to do this time. And that's the thing. Who would believe it? Genesis makes clear that every child is at the creator's will. He opens wombs closes wombs. He does not demand child sacrifice. That's not the kind of God he is. And we hope that the Lord never calls us to exhibit the kind of faith that Abraham had to exhibit. This is not what we want to do. This is not what we want anyone to do. And more than that, if somebody came to us and told us that the Lord told them to do this, we wouldn't believe them. We would think they were insane or mentally disturbed, and they needed to get help. And that's what's very troubling for us. How can the greatest exemplar of faith exhibit characteristics of mental illness? I think that the sort of struggle we face when we think about our own children, and I know this is uh, true for myself. I think I've never read this story the same again since uh, we had our own children. My son had a minor thing when he was born. He had to stay in the hospital in a little incubator thing. I was very upset. And I was traveling to teach. And I just remember thinking, <sighs> the sun came up above the clouds. The light shot through the plane. I just thought, how did Abraham do it? How could he do it? And, uh, I hope none of us are tested this way, but I, I, I think I have to say that what the man with the troubled son said to our Lord in the gospel according to Mark is my prayer. I believe, help my unbelief. Well, nonetheless, when we focus upon what Abraham did, uh, we learn that by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as sacrifice. He who had embraced the promise was about to sacrifice his only son. And it goes on to say, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. 
Now that's what the uh, author of Hebrews says when he describes this event in Abraham's faith. And a lot of times we quickly read that and say, oh, he just thought he would bring him back from the dead. Uh, Perhaps so, but it doesn't say when. And the very next verse troubles us if we look at the context. The author of Hebrews goes on to say, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. When we think about the blessing that Isaac gave to Jacob, it was an accident and it's described as by faith. So we need to be careful not to reduce the tensions that are created by this horrific challenge that this man had by just making it go away. This is a great and terrible thing Abraham was asked to do. Uh, James says in James chapter 2, You foolish person! Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Now, of course, that's a controversial context, but to put it in simple terms, James makes the point that faith leads to obedience of God's will, even when it doesn't make sense. And what Genesis does for us is it brings a great challenge to us. It does show us what faith looks like. And the upshot of all of this is not only a challenge for us, but an uh, affirmation from God of his permanent covenant with this man of faith. Abraham obeyed God and the angel of the Lord stopped him. It was all just a test and we knew it. But Abraham didn't.